Today is Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022, and it is a great pleasure for me to interview this morning Tom O'Neill, who had a long and distinguished career as an engineer, industry executive, and academic, and has been recognized by many prestigious awards by the mining community and the National Academy of Engineering. My name is Michael Carmis, and I have recently retired as a Stony Parker Professor of Mining and Minerals Engineering at Virginia Tech. This interview is being conducted as part of the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical and Petroleum Engineers Oral History, and we're sitting in the Hilton Hotel in Salt Lake City, just next door in a way to the Convention Center where the SME Annual Meeting and Convention is currently underway. And it is my pleasure to start and asking Tom some questions. Tom, welcome to this interview. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the kind introduction. So, Tom, starting with the first question about your early life, tell me where you grew up and something about your family. I spent the first uh, 18 years of my life, Mike, in a small town in western New York called Fredonia. It's about halfway between Buffalo and Erie in the extreme western tip of New York State. Uh, my wife is from the adjacent town of Dunkirk, which is only three miles away, and we'll celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary this year. Uh, my, f I had a, my father was a, 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 a Irish Catholic, my mother was a German Lutheran, so when they got married, it was somewhat of a, a, a crisis in the community. <laughs> Uh, he came from a long line of poor Irishmen. He was the first um, first O'Neill to graduate from high school. And then he worked for about four years and finally went to college and he graduated in 1931 from the University of Michigan. Uh, my mother taught primary school. So we were, and I had one, one uh, sibling, my sister, older sister, and she had quite a distinguished career as well. She uh, uh, graduated, she's retired as uh, Dean of Nursing from Columbia University just a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, she's in the National Academy of Medicine, and so she's had a very distinguished career. Uh, so um, I spent the first 18 years of my life there, graduated from high school in Fredonia High School in 1958. And how did you decide on an engineering career? Uh, well, that's uh, interesting. Uh, um, I told you a little bit about my father. What I didn't tell you was he died very suddenly at a young age, 51. I was 15 at the time. Um, so I didn't have uh, male guidance on some of these things when I was younger. So when I was in high school, I did what most young men did when I was there. I played sports and chased girls. Right. <laughs> but I was a pretty good student, and uh, my, my high school student teachers tried to steer me towards a math and science program. And uh, another thing I was very interested in as a child, I still am, are maps. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a map nut. <laughs> I have a lot of maps, and I, uh, as a kid, I used to study them. So one thing I wanted to do in my career was to see the world. So the guidance counselor in high school had a bunch of brochures, which I read, and I lit on one called geophysics because it had to do with oil exploration. And I had visions of myself traveling the world and, and doing oil exploration. Uh, so I, I decided I was going to major in geophysics. I only applied to two colleges, Lehigh and Penn State, and I, I ended up going to Lehigh and I was going to study geophysics. Uh, but it was a very small school in, at Lehigh, and it included mining engineering and uh, uh, mining geology and a couple of mineral processes. There's only about eight or ten of us in all, all those disciplines. So we all took field trips together. And on those field trips, we would go to underground mines. And I decided that that was really exciting. I loved being in mines. So I, so I transferred into mining it after my freshman year at Lehigh. Yeah.
Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, Lehigh is a very historic school, sure. Uh, did you have any summer work in industry while you were a student at Lehigh? I, I did, and, it, and it, it kind of affected what I decided to do in life. Uh, the only encounter I really had uh, in my career in mining was between my junior and senior year when I worked underground at Climax in Colorado. And uh, it, was a, it was a glorious summer. I just loved what I did. And it convinced me of two things in my life. One, I'd made the right choice going into mining. And secondly, I wanted to live in the West. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have done both, right? Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, so you now have graduated in mining engineering. Uh, when did you get your first job after graduation? Well, I, I um, um, one thing about graduating, my junior year in Lehigh, they announced that they were going to close the mining program. So there were two of us that graduated together in my senior year in, <laughs> at Lehigh. And I used to tell my students when I was teaching in Arizona that there's really hope for you because I graduated last in my class. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> the other fellow had a higher GPA than I did. <laughs> uh, but there was another uh, uh, well-known Lehigh mining engineer by the name of Stan Michelson who worked for Kennecott Copper. And the head of the department at Lehigh got an interview with me with Stan and it led to my first job, which was with Kennecott in Salt Lake City. So my wife and I were married just about the time I graduated from college, and our, we took off for our first uh, home, right. which was in Salt Lake City, okay. for two years. All right. This is coming home then back to you with this <laughs> meeting and this conference. In a way. What was your duties uh, during that first job? Well, Kennecott had a very good management training program. They hired about 20 engineers. I was one of them and put us through this management training program. And we spent time in each one of their plants, the mine, concentrator, smelter, and refinery. And uh, after that first portion of the training program, they sent you back to one of these properties for a longer stay. So I selected the smelter, oddly enough. So I went back to the smelter and worked for about six months. I was really fascinated with the smelting process. And I thought maybe I wanted to go to graduate school in, in metallurgy at that time. Yes. So I talked to a couple of schools on graduate school in metallurgy and found out I was going to have to take a lot of remedial stuff to, to get a master's degree in metallurgy. So I didn't do that. And then I transferred to Bingham Canyon Mine for a year, which I really enjoyed too. Did you uh, develop professional relationships with uh, other mining people, mining associations, or anything like that? Uh, really not yet. That was the kind of the one downside of my work. I was really a small cog in a big organization. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, there were about 20 of us that went through this management program. So um, I took a couple of courses at the University of Utah just to... And, in management, thinking, well, maybe I'm going to go into management. Uh, but I didn't get really involved in too many professional activities until somewhat later in my career. And then you decided to go back to school. Yes. Well, it was kind of an interesting. My, um, I think Lehigh is a very fine university, and my basic engineering background was quite good. But as I mentioned, it was, mining was a pretty tiny part of that organization. And I discovered working for Kennecott that I didn't uh, really know as much about mining as I'd like to. So um, I had a letter from uh, Howard Hartman, who you know is a oh, yes. famous mining professor at Penn State at that time. And he was looking for graduate students. And he'd gotten my name from Bob Gallagher, who was the head of the department at Lehigh. And my wife and I talked it over. He said, well, I think maybe a master's degree in mining will help me out to understand my right. chosen field a little bit more. 
So off we went to Penn State. Now, who was your advisor at Penn State? It was Hartman or somebody else? Well, uh, I, I was Hartman's teaching assistant for the two. I was ac actually at Penn State for 18 months to get my master's degree. And I was his teaching assistant. <clears throat> but my, uh, my thesis advisor was Chuck Manula. Okay. Who was a brilliant guy, no PhD. Right. But he knew his field with operations, research, statistics, right. computer applications. And Bob Safanko was there at that time. He was head of the department. Right. And Bob was very helpful to me, too. But I, I actually studied up for my, my master's and my master's thesis under Chuck. Mm -hmm. But I do want to say that my association with Howard Hartman was one of the more important things in my career. Um, I was his teaching assistant, and if you know Howard, he was organized. Right. And boom, 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 he knew what you wanted, and he knew, he told you what to do, and what to, so you told how to behave. You huh? taught ventilation, I take it? Oh, I'm yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. But um, he was very kind to me, but I, I learned a lot just by, by being his teaching assistant, by watching him conduct himself. And my subsequent years, when I was taught teaching, I used a lot of the same approach and right. materials that he had. And uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but he was visiting professor at Arizona for a year when I was chairman of the department there, so we renewed our acquaintance at that time. We will come back to, to Arizona yeah, a little yeah. bit in the question. Um, now you have a master's degree. What do you do? Well, um, I was at a master's degree, and we had our second child. Our first one was born in Salt Lake City. Second one was born when we were at Penn State. And um, we were broke, <laughs> <laughs> as grad students That's are. Uh, and Ingersoll Rand did a good job of recruiting me. I thought I wanted to go back west, and we ultimately did return to the West. Um, but they did a very good job recruiting me. I offered me a nice job in the drill division. They were in, at that time, they were one of the biggest drill manufacturers in the country. And I was working as a new product development, which was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I took the job with Ingersoll Rand and they treated me very well. Where were you located with Ingersoll Rand? We lived in Easton, Pennsylvania. The plant was in Phillipsburg, right across the river in New Jersey. Right. Uh, and I traveled uh, quite a bit. They gave me some very interesting jobs. Uh, we had some new products that were, were out for testing in the field, and I, I was kind of a field engineer, sat on those projects. We had one where we were busting up the runway at Boeing Field in Seattle with a new breaker, and I sat on that project for... <laughs> for about three weeks. So I had some really interesting right. work with them. And because it was in new product development, you got to meet the executives of the country, company. My, my uh, boss, his name was John Adams, but the CEO of the company was a man by the name of Tom Holmes. And I met him on several occasions. He was very good to me. In my later years, he provided me with very nice letters of reference for new jobs. He was a very kind man. So, Tom, you have some time spent with Ingersoll Rand, and uh, you, you enjoyed, obviously, that job and uh, traveling around and talking to people and operations. But you are start thinking also going back to graduate school. When you were at Penn State, did you uh, had ideas of further education and there is anything at Penn State to help you uh, start looking at other things as well in education? Well, you, you, you're actually right on the money there, Mike. Uh, uh, as much as I enjoyed my work with Ingersoll Rand, as well as they treated me, I did have this experience working for Howard at Penn State, which I greatly admired him. Uh, my master's thesis at Penn State ended up in being the basis for the Peel Award that I was awarded from uh, SME. Right. Uh, so I, these academic 
um, aspirations were fueled by Penn State. And so um, after two years at Ingersoll Rand, uh, I had to try to decide what I wanted to do when I grow up. I kind of moved around a bit. Um, so uh, Ingersoll Rand, as much as it was uh, a fine company, they were really more of a construction oriented than mining oriented. So it took me away from mining a bit. And um, I did have this idea that I wanted to be a professor. So again, we talked it over and uh, I decided I wanted to, to uh, move on and get a PhD. And Howard Hartman uh, helped me and recommended a couple schools. Um, and I needed more than an assistantship now because we had three children now. Okay. The third one was born when we were <laughs> with Ingersoll Rand. So I had a, ch a chance for an instructorship, two, two chances, University of Minnesota, University of Arizona. Uh, so uh, in line with our desire to live in the West again, we decided to uh, go to Arizona. So we packed up a U-Haul truck, uh, drove 2,500 miles, uh, my wife following in the car with our three-year-old and one-year-old, and uh, ended up in Tucson. So, uh, obviously, you now have uh, children and family, and you change places. Uh, how the family adapted, your wife and children, in all these moves? Uh, well, remarkably well. I mean, my wife is a saint. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> if, if I decided I want to do something, she said, is that what you want to do? We'll do it. Right. And uh, she f was wonderful at that throughout our many years. Um, fortunately, uh, I was in Tucson for 13 years once we moved there. So our children were really raised in Tucson. They didn't really have to move until they're uh, in their high school years, which is pretty hard. Right. Uh, but that was, I didn't travel much at that time, so I never missed a parents' night or right. a little league game or a swim meet. I was there pretty much all the time. So you're pursuing a PhD at the University of Arizona, but from what I understand, you also minored in finance, which is quite <laughs> unusual. Uh, yeah, I think it was. Don Gentry, our mutual friend, also yes. did that. Uh, we were both interested in the, got interested in the business part of mine. We felt pretty comfortable in our, our technical knowledge in mining, but we didn't, were less comfortable in knowing about the mining business or how mining, and the peculiar in, uh, re relationships you have in mining with a right. depletable asset and so forth. So, so uh, we took a couple of courses in finance and decided we, maybe we could construct a minor around mineral economics with, a, with an emphasis in finance. And there was a very receptive professor of finance at Arizona, Clark Hawkins, who helped us out and, and uh, en enabled us to do that. That, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, your doctoral advisor, Bill Lacey, uh, tell us a little bit about him. And of course, he at some point moved to James Cook University in Australia before you got finished your PhD. How did <laughs> that work out? Well, it, it actually turned out just about the time I was finishing it. Okay. Bill Lacey was, a, was kind of the next man in my life who was a real mentor and a, just a fine man. He uh, passed away a couple of years ago. I think he was 95. Uh, but he was chairman of the department and very kind to us and our family when we arrived in Tucson. He, he took us in, all five of us, and we lived with, us in his, with him for a few weeks till we found a place to live. And, and, uh, but when he left, uh, it left a big hole at Arizona. And um, I was just finishing my PhD. And um, the remaining faculty all decided they didn't want to be department head. So they came to me and said, would I do it? And I just graduated with my PhD. <laughs> and I agreed to, and uh, they were able to talk the dean of the College of Mines at that time, Bill Drescher, into me being departmented.
So you are now 34 years of age, according to my notes. You are an associate professor and department head at the University of Arizona. Kind of strange, huh? It is, and quite <laughs> unusual, and spectacular. Well, no one else wanted the job, it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure they recognize the talent. But when they, uh, <laughs> when they decided they had to give me the job, they said, well, we can't have an assistant professor be head of the department, so they jumped me over the assistant lever and made me untenured associate. Associate professor, okay. <laughs> I was untenured. Uh, and of course, at that time, you were able to establish a more formal mineral economics program. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was one of the, one of, one of the uh, I feel, one of my contributions I made. We, uh, of course, as you recognize, I had interest in mineral economics through my finance minor and so forth. <clears throat> and I, I, I decided we needed a, a, a graduate-only program and mineral economics would be successful. There weren't very many programs like that in the country. Penn State and Colorado School of Mines have mineral economics programs. And I still believe that's a program that would be well received. So we were able to recruit Deverell Harris from Penn State, who was one of the best known people in the field, to start that program. And we got a couple of other faculty positions, ended up with about three people in mineral economics for a master's and PhD only program. And that program grew over the four years I was department chairman. And it, well, when I left, uh, I think we had something like 20 to 25 grad students in that program. Mm. Uh, a number of foreign students there, and they were quite, quite distinguished people. They had, had, had great careers. Unfortunately, after I left, my successors didn't, were more traditionally minded and the program kind of slid downhill until it was discontinued. Mm. It's interesting now that the school is rethinking that and they're rethinking of starting a program again in that area right now. That, 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 that's true. <clears throat> uh, when you were there also, tell us a little bit what happened with San Xavier Mine. Is that was that the mine that was always at the department and the university, or how? Well, we yeah, we gave it a big boost. When I was chairman, we uh, we had the San Javier mine was located in about 25 miles southwest of the university. It had been a gift to the university by some former graduate, and it was just a hole in the ground. And we used it for geological mapping and mine surveying. But we decided to really reinvigorate that project, and um, we had a. a a head frame donated to us by Phelps Dodge, and students and one of our faculty members, Ed Jusifik, went down to Bisbee and, and took down this 30-foot high head frame and re-erected it on the mine. Uh, we got some donations of equipment, uh, a drill jumbo, compressors, uh, and the students took charge and developed this mine until it's actually a, a well-functioning student mine today. We've got enough research contracts, so we built sure. a couple of small, a couple of buildings out there, a classroom building and a shop, and uh, it's been really successful. And the students are all volunteers out there, and they spend their weekends out yeah. there. This is a unique facility, and you're correct. The students do enjoy getting involved. Oh, they do, yeah. Any other accomplishments you would like to add at that time? Uh, I worked on a lot of things. After one thing it was I got involved with the Indian community in Arizona. Um, first as a consultant, uh, on, they were looking to help with negotiating min uh, mining contracts, mineral development contracts with companies. And I helped them with royalty agreements. Uh, I helped them negotiate the sale of the Lakeshore Mine to Heckler Mining Company. And in doing that, I got acquainted with a number of the tribes. I worked for several other Indian tribes in the same capacity. Uh, and so I did, and we had a, a, a student in mining engineering. It was a Navajo student, a very nice young man, but he was, had a trouble getting through the program. He finally made it. But it really got me interested in the hard time that American Indian students have in science and engineering. So I started a chapter of ACES, American Indians 
Science and Engineering Society, I guess that's what it is, yeah. And I was the first campus advisor for students in there to try to help them get through the culture shock, which they have coming to a big university. And uh, that's been quite successful. Uh, today there are many, many more Indian students in science and engineering right. things. And uh, let me see, what else? I, oh, we, we formalized the APCOM conference series when I was a chairman in Arizona. It was a kind of a, um, APCOM stands for Applications of Computers and Mining, which sounds kind of naive today, because right. there's applications of computers and everything. Right. right. But there wasn't at that time. So it was a chance for people from around the world to meet and present their papers on different kinds of computer applications and mining. And that, I think that we still, still exists strong. today, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, so we started with, formalize it with four universities and, right. and, uh, and so I was and instrumental in that. has proven to be a very international meeting as well. I mean. Yeah, it has, yeah. I yeah. can remember one we did when the Russians were there and I got debriefed by the FBI right. afterwards. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I managed to get a pilot's license along the way, where I, so I could oh, I see. so okay. I could go recruit at the, at the Indian high schools yeah. and so forth. That, that's wonderful. So you are now uh, having few years in Arizona. You are approaching about forty, I think, if my notes are mm -hmm. right. And you start thinking yet for another career. Tell us <laughs> about that. Yeah, when's Tom going to grow up? Huh? <laughs> Um, yeah, you're right, Mike. Um, I, I enjoyed my years at Arizona, and uh, if you're a department chairman and you conceive of a career in academic administration, the next job is to deanship somewhere. Right. And uh, I, in the late 70s, there I had a couple of overtures, and I looked into and I took a job as a dean. At a, at a major university, which you know, we're not right. going to talk about that in detail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, after a couple of weeks on the job, we had a major disagreement. Right. And I thought, if two years on the job, if I'm having a major disagreement, this is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I resigned. I uh, went back to Arizona. They took me back. <laughs> For a year, you said two years. I think you mean two weeks. <laughs> two weeks was all. I was at the dean's job. Did I say two years? Yes. No, it was two weeks. Two weeks. Yes. Two weeks. <laughs> um, so I sat down and said, "Well, Tom, what are you going to do now? You know, uh, you can't do this department chairman job forever. I didn't want that. This dean stuff didn't look very good." And so I said, "Maybe I should look at industry again. Maybe that's a better match of my." ambitions and my abilities. And um, along came a gentleman who I used to, I worked for a long time ago at Kennecott. He was now executive vice president of Amico Minerals. And I had his son as a student, which was part of the way <laughs> I got to know him again, who offered me a job. And before we get to this and as we finish in the academic sort of part of your life, uh, young engineers often ask if graduate school is a good idea for them. Any advice you would like to offer? Well, it's, that's really hard to advise anybody because it's highly specific. Uh, it goes with, with an individual's desires and what he th views for his career. Uh, if you're going to go into, if you view your career going into management of a mining company, uh, a second degree in an MBA or mineral economics is probably a good idea. If you view your career more in technical, you're going to be uh, going to technology, ultimately into maybe consulting or an engineering company, uh, a, a second degree in your frozen, pro chosen professional field is probably worthwhile. I think, on balance, I think graduate education is great. I think it makes you you get more mature, you get to know your field better, you get it, you're no longer dealing with undergraduate issues, you're focusing on a, on a research project. I, I think graduate education is really good.
And I don't know anybody who's ever regretted it. Right. Okay, let's go back to industry. Amaco Minerals and Cyprus Minerals. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was interesting. Uh, Amaco, like all the big oil companies, got into mining. When they had so much money in the 70s, they didn't know what to do with it. They figured if it just came out of the mine, how hard could it be, right? Right. Um, so they got into mining, and like other oil companies, got in in a big way. Uh, Amoco Minerals was located in Denver, and uh, it was a collection of the most talented people I've ever worked with. They paid well, and they had some of the best, smartest people I've ever worked with in the industry. But they also brought along lots of red tape. It was a you know big mining, big oil company way of doing things. Uh, so they had three divisions, a uh, uh, coal company, metals company, industrial minerals company, and then they had Rio Blanco oil shale. I was manager of business development for the metals part of the company. Well, about a year after I'd been with Amico, the mining business was slowly sliding down the tubes. In fact, the rest of my career has been uh, with mining companies at the trough in the cycle, right. not in the peaks. <laughs> peaks like we've been in the last few years. So they, after uh, pouring hundreds of millions of dollars in real Blanco oil shale, they threw in the towel. And rather than getting out of mining immediately, they just turned the screws down. So there wasn't much business development to do. So I spent more of my time selling properties when I was with Amico than I did developing them. Now, Tom, while you were with Amico, you were able also to finish a textbook. Uh, and during that period, uh, you know, working and doing a textbook is not always easy. Tell us about it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mike. I, I'm really proud of the textbook that Don Gentry, my co-author, and I wrote, uh, entitled Mine Investment Analysis. And it served as the um, standard, standard text textbook. for mining economics courses for probably 20 years. SME published it. I know that they finally ran out of copies, and uh, we talked about a second edition, but it never did. But it was it was a good standard textbook for a number of years, and I'm quite proud of it. And if I made a comment, uh, it was a textbook all over the world. It was not just in the U.S. Oh, so. thank you. Uh, getting back to Cyprus, uh, the spin-off of Cyprus Minerals, and, and uh, that was a difficult time, I'm sure. The mining business was depressed at that time. Tell us a little bit about that period. Yes, it was a time of uh, real uncertainty. Um, uh, the people who were, were the Amoco Minerals who had an opportunity to go back with the oil, oil company side, they all left went back to Chicago. and. Um, so it was a big change in management of the spun-off company. And uh, we didn't have much, uh, uh, as you point out, it was a weak time in the industry. We didn't have a whole lot of financial strength. I can remember one of my last jobs as man of business development manager. Getty Oil was getting out of mining at the same time, mm -hmm. and they had a beautiful portfolio of mining properties. And I led a team to go look at these properties. And um, one of them was the Escondida mm -hmm. property in Chile, which they had a major interest in. And as you know, Escondida is the biggest and best copper mine in the world. Right. So we had a chance to bid on that, but we were financially unable to do so. So uh, it was uh, a time when the only part of the industry that uh, was healthy was gold. So Amoco, now Cyprus, had a number of gold properties undeveloped. Um, and I was given one 
uh, called Copperstone, which was in western Arizona. And I was given the job as project manager for that. So I had full authority for designing and building this mine. And it was another great step in my career. I, it was one of the most enjoyable times I had. It wasn't a big mine. I think we only spent 20 million on it or something. But I had full authority to go through the initial testing and metallurgical testing, designing the flow sheet, hiring engineering companies, uh, hiring contract managers, construction companies for Copperstone, and that was an exciting time for me. And this was your first gold project as well, I would it, think. It was, right. Mm -hmm. So what happens after that? Well, I, I, we got to within about uh, two months of commissioning that mine when Cyprus asked me to move to Australia and and take responsibility for a whole series of gold projects we had in Australia. So family is moving again <laughs> to where in Australia? Well we moved to Sydney. Uh, only our children are either out of college or just in college except for my younger son and we took him out of his halfway through his senior year in high school and took him to Australia with us. And he doesn't regret it at all. Yeah, he had a great a time in Australia. Right. We lived in Sydney, and uh, uh, we Cyprus had, it was an all it was all joint ventures, and we were developing about five different small mines in Australia and in New Zealand. So my job was all over the South Pacific and uh, dealing with joint venture partners and constructing these small mines. Uh, one of the we had an exciting gold project, which I visited uh, on a couple occasions in Guadalcanal, for example. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty exciting. And we were in the mine, underground mine in New Zealand we were developing. It was exciting. So it was, it was, a, it was a good year. I'll tell you one story about it. Uh, this is the kind of thing you have to deal with. Uh, we were developing a mine called Selwyn in western Queensland. And we were within a month of of commissioning the mine. We just got the ball mill installed and the ball mill was 20 feet, 4 feet in diameter or in, in length 12 feet in diameter. Not an insignificant ball mill. Mm -hmm. And it was it was constructed to in two pieces it was flange in the middle. Right. On on wet commissioning the mill just broke in half. Just went boom like that. So these <laughs> <laughs> these, these are the kind of things you kind of encounter in your career. So that was really an exciting it, time. It was. Yeah. Got me in lawsuits uh, <laughs> with uh, in Australia, and uh, so yeah. it, it was a it was a, um, a tense moment or two. So you spent all together what about two years in two Australia? years in Australia, yeah. and then what happens? <laughs> well, then Cyprus asked me to move back to the states and be general manager of their. The, bigger, the biggest mine they had, which was still is a big mine for the successor company called Sierrita, which is uh, south of Tucson, so we're moving back to Tucson again. Yes. And I was general manager there for a couple of years. Um, my wife, my dear wife, who uh, never had a chance to go to college when she, was a, when she was younger, when we first lived in Tucson, she got a bachelor's degree in nursing, and then she went on and got a master's degree in nursing at Colorado when we lived in Denver. And then she taught at the University of Arizona for those two years when we were back there again. So it was kind of a big step for her, too. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, and then after that, you are thinking of another change. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, halfway through that, I, again, I was contacted by a recruiter and uh, um, Cleveland Cliffs approached me. Um, they had, were having one of their senior executives was retiring and they were looking for someone to take over all technical functions for the company. So we were one of the few people that ever moved from Tucson to Cleveland. It's usually the other way around. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> uh, but it, it started my, uh, let's see, I was in Cliffs for 
12 years. My 12 years with Cleveland Clifton. So, Tom, you are now joining another company, another commodity, actually, and you are part of Cleveland Cliffs. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was quite a change for me, as you might suspect. Um, Cleveland Cliffs today has been around for about 175 years. Uh, for about 170 of those years, we are in iron ore, iron ore mining, basically only, although they had a couple of excursions and some other things which didn't work out, but they're iron ore mining company. In the last few years, of course, they've become one of the biggest steel companies in the United States. But my time with them was when they were an iron ore mining company. And um, as you might suspect, for a company that's 150 years old when I joined them, um, it was a pretty strong culture. Uh, to my knowledge, I was the only person hired at a senior executive level in, from the outside in Cleveland Cliffs ever. Everybody was there had been there forever. So it was a very strong culture. Uh, and it was an interesting company uh, in that uh, we had a lot of responsibility for iron ore mines, but we didn't have a very big ownership interest. So if you look at a Cleveland Cliffs annual report, our, our sales revenues weren't very high. But I had ultimately responsibility for six mines and about 5,000 employees. Uh, so it was an unusual, all of our mines were joint ventures. We only owned one mine outright. And all of the joint venture partners were major steel companies. Uh, so my first job there was in technical. And then uh, I advanced to uh, another level uh, where I had one mine reporting to our one non-union mine, which we hoped to kept to a non-union. And ultimately I had all the other mines, which were union mines, report to me. And then finally when I retired, I was president and chief operating officer. But I can go through some of that more detail if you wish, but... Well, one thing of interest would be the steel industry was in depression at that point. How a company like Cliff manages that? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. This is another part of my career. I'm in, in the trough of the mining business, not in the peaks. <laughs> And uh, through the 90s, it was very tough times for steel. Um, uh, I used to say when I worked for Cleveland Cliffs, we were a simple company. We had one product, iron ore pellets, one customer, the blast furnace. And through the 90s, it was a very tough time for the integrated steel companies to compete, to compete with the Chinese, with the Koreans, um, Japanese steel companies. And uh, so there were a lot of pending financial problems, resulting in a number of uh, bankruptcies. So we watched with dread as some of these blast furnaces were shut down and some of these companies went into uh, bankruptcy. So we had to really turn down the cost in our operations. Uh, we couldn't take a strike at any of our properties because our steel company partners couldn't afford it. And so it was a tough time. Uh, but I learned a lot there, you know? You learn a lot when things are tough. tough right. You learn how to survive. And I find myself spending more time, less time on technical as my job progressed, more time on pensions, healthcare systems, working with actuaries, working with lawyers, work on environmental problems, not too much on mining problems. But it was very educational, I learned a lot. Tom, did uh, you do or Cliff did anything different to survive this uh, depression of the steel industry? Uh, well, we tried. Um, we saw the shrinkage in the one customer, Blast Furnaces and the growth of the mini mill business of electric furnace produced steel in the country. And the one growth product for iron in that business was direct reduced iron, DRI, HBI, hot briquetted iron. And uh, so we, um, with our limited financial resource, we built a plant in Trinidad 
to produce uh, hot briquetted iron. And uh, it was a hydrogen reduction process. It was a new process we developed with Lurgy. It was their process, really. The pilot, pilot plant was ours. And we built that plant in um, Trinidad. And uh, it was not successful. We, we built, we produced some iron, but we couldn't do it commercially. So that was our one stab in that. Now, if you've follow cliffs in recent years. They just built a plant in Toledo, Ohio to build, uh, to make direct reduced iron with a more conventional method. And I understand that that's going much better. Uh, but uh, as you well know, most of the steel in this country is produced now through electric furnaces and uh, they consume a lot of reduced iron. In fact, even blast furnaces are consuming direct reduced iron now to increase their productivity. But our, when I was with Cliffs, our one endeavor that didn't work out very well. So altogether, you are how many years with uh, Cleveland Cliffs? Uh, 91 to 2003 when I retired, yeah. All right. And um, uh, my timing is was very poor, <laughs> but about 2004, the the iron ore price started to go up. Right. Steel prices went up. 2005, 2008. I mean, it was, it was boom time. Right. And I was retired. Oh, okay. you missed the boom time. You, <laughs> I missed you, the boom you, time. You, you caught the downtime, but yeah, the but it was it, it was a great uh, it was a great experience. experience uh, right. I, I uh, as I mentioned, it was a, uh, a company that had very strong culture, had very strong silos. It was it was tough to bust down silos. Right. You've been in education. You know about silos. Oh, yeah. Education's tough to beat punch, punch down silos. A lot of talk about interdisciplinary stuff on campus, but hard to make it work because you got those silos. People won't talk to one another much. In your time at Cliffs, uh, I'm sure you spent a lot of time on health and safety issues, and I know you're a big proponent of all that. Yeah, that was uh, the one area we, uh, we couldn't expand. One thing I wanted to do when I came to Cliffs was I recognized that we had very limited growth opportunities because we were tied to the blast furnace, domestic blast furnace. We couldn't compete internationally. So uh, where could we take our skills that we had? We were very good miners, very good producers of pellets. So I had a couple of projects, foreign projects, which looked very promising, one in Peru, one in Venezuela. Of course, that wouldn't have worked out very well now, but uh, at the time, it looked pretty promising. Uh, but now we didn't have any, we didn't have any financial strength to pursue any of those things in the late 90s. Uh, so the one area that we weren't, as good as I had hoped it would be was in safety. Uh, our safety record was pretty average. So we spent a lot of time in the last few years of my, when I was president, of beefing up our safety program, getting more into a more behavioral based program uh, where you're working with people to to make sure that they don't pursue unsafe practices because uh, un unsafe conditions are usually not the biggest problem in industrial safety, it's unsafe practices. So we spent a lot of time on that and it has improved. Uh, even today, they're much better at safety. So I take pride in what we accomplished there anyway. And it's well recognized, as you know. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit, you received a lot of awards and honors and recognitions during that time. Anything that stands? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I was very fortunate and humbled by some of the recognition I have. We, uh, I won the um, AIME, the, the RAND Award and the Saunders Gold Medals. Uh, the Mining and Metallurgical Society awarded me their gold medal. Uh, I was elected to the uh, American Mining Hall of Fame in Tucson. Uh, I was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1999, uh, distinguished alumni at Penn State in Arizona. So I'm very humbled by all those. Probably not deserved well, but it... Well, you're modest, very well deserved. 
Uh, you served on uh, a number of board of directors, both uh, before and after retiring from Cliffs. Anything about serving on board of companies? Well, this was a, was a, great, um, a great experience for me. Um, I served on the board of six different mining companies, two big ones, two small ones, and two little ones. <laughs> uh, four of them were ultimately acquired uh, so it was a it was a very interesting experience. I worked with three of them were American companies, three of them were Canadian companies, and I got to meet very interesting people, and it really out of the box stuff that I was doing. I I, I generally uh, on the, those boards I chaired the the environmental safe and dean health committees, which I had more of my my experience was. So it was a it was a fine experience, and I, it was a great way to me kind of culminate my uh, my uh, career. And I think I left the last board maybe four years ago, something like okay. that. That's wonderful. Uh, so, Tom, uh, just summarizing a little bit, uh, it would be interesting, I think, for somebody like you to provide an opinion or some thoughts. You've been a faculty member in a university, you've been an administrator in a university, you've been an engineer, you run technology, and you've been a corporate person. Uh, that's a very diverse portfolio of jobs. Uh, similarities, differences between all these? Uh, well, um, of course, the similarities, the obvious similarity is you're just dealing with people. Right. You're dealing with people all the time. Uh, both academia and my experience in industry give you a couple of things you want out of a career. One's are intellectual engagement and talent. Uh, in academia, you're doing your research, or in my case, I was building programs. And those took a lot of intellectual rigor to figure out how to get through that stuff. Uh, and the second thing is they offer you, they both offer you opportunities for creativity, which you really want in your career. In my case, and I was academia, we discussed some of the things we did, mm -hmm. the mineral economic program, the school of mines, which are really gave me some creative satisfaction. And then again, an industry was kind of building mines and, and there's nothing was more fun than when I had that, that um, project manager job and built the mine. In industry, you're able to see the results of your decisions more quickly, which is a big advantage. Uh, and you do have a better opportunity for busting some of those silos. So uh, um, that was something that I really enjoyed. One, uh, one final thing is that I told my sons when they had the desk, talked to me about my career, and they have quite successful careers. I said, the one thing you gotta learn in management is dealing with ambiguity. Um, and being able to deal with that effectively is going to largely determine your success as a manager. Because you have certain goals in management, you want to get to this point. But it's never a straight line. It has a lot of twists and turns in it. And you find yourself having making decisions that you'd rather not make because it takes you off the straight line to that goal. But you got to keep that goal in mind, and you have to deal with that ambiguity. Uh, so I think that's uh, something that will serve you well no matter where you sit in your career. Let me turn over to professional societies. You've been the president of SME in 203. Uh, any comments and memories during your involvement with Professional like I said. Well, there's a couple of memories uh, because again, it was uh, it was a trough in the mining business, and when it's a trough in mining, it's a trough in SME too. 
I think we had a little discussion about that this morning. Yes, and <laughs> may I say, I, I presented you with that trophy because I was the president of 202. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm to blame too. But business was pretty weak at that yeah. point in time, and uh, the society it was losing members and the questionable, problematic finances. But we uh, we made change in change in the executive director. Uh, our current executive director is uh, is outstanding in my view. Uh, but I had to uh, had to let the previous one go. And we had to uh, reinvigorate the foundation. The foundation was floundering a bit, and uh, I got on their case a little bit. Told them that. We needed to do things a little bit differently, and uh, I, uh, at least two of the people on the foundation at that time have come back to me in later years and thanked me for that. So the foundation is doing great now. And, and but we were we uh, it, it was an interesting time. You were president, so you enjoyed the right. experience. I did too, in spite of the fact that we were the industry was not doing well at that time. Uh, any comments on the future of mining and the prospects for young minerals and mining engineers? Well, I think, uh, you know, as I guess Mark Twain said, it's, it's very difficult making forecasts, particularly about the future. Uh, so I'm not big on forecasts, but I think one thing is pretty certain. There will be a continuing demand for minerals, and it'll be a growing demand. It won't grow uh, without some bumps and twists and ups and downs, and it may not grow as rapidly as um, as the other parts of the economy do. But it will grow. So there will be opportunity. Those opportunities there will be um, for miners. Um, I think there'll be more opportunities internationally than maybe domestically. It's gotten so hard to make, get permits to build a mine in the, this country. And that difficulty in building new mines and the, and the long time it takes contributes to the boom and bust cycle in mining. Because you've got to make a commitment to spend hundreds of millions of dollars 10 or 12 years before you're going to see the outcome of that. So that's going to contribute to the... But there's no doubt in my mind that there will be a growing demand for minerals and for well-educated, enthusiastic young people, it's a, it'll make a wonderful career. Tom, any final comments you wish to make? We're at the end. Well, you know, I've loved my career. Uh, I have a hard time remembering waking up in the morning and not, couldn't wait to get to work. I'd probably do it over again. I, I hope I wouldn't make the same mistakes, <laughs> just make different mistakes next time. But I, I, I truly loved it. Um, I, I can't imagine sitting in a cubicle for your career or behind a desk for your career, entire career. Um, my, my good friend Dave Lowell, who just passed away recently, uh, when he was 90, he was still climbing around the Andes, his loved, beloved Andes in Peru looking for ore. All I can say is I, I, we all should be so lucky. Right. Well, Tom, you have a fascinating life story to go with a distinguished and diverse career. It was truly a great pleasure to spend time with you today. And thank you very much again for your willingness to share your story with AIME. It was a pleasure.